So tonight, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Joe Farah. Uh, he and I have been corresponding for a number of months. Joe, initially, uh, I got in touch with you, I think, during the midst of the pandemic, and you expressed a really strong desire to come here when we were able to be open physically so you could see our facilities. And fortunately for us, we timed it just right because you will be leaving at the end of this month for UC Santa Barbara to continue your studies in astrophysics, supernova, and specifically. Uh, I don't know how many of your friends you're going to be taking with you, but I'm sure <laughs> some of them will be sorry to have you go. <laughs> but it sounds like a wonderful opportunity. So Joe is uh, currently, until the end of the month, working at the Center for Astrophysics uh, at Harvard in Cambridge. He's a PhD student in astrophysics, uh, will be at uh, UC Santa Barbara. As an undergraduate, Joseph worked at the Event Horizon Telescope Project, which is what he's going to be talking about tonight, as a Smithsonian fellow at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics under the supervision of the brilliant Michael Johnson. Brilliant, if you needed to score brownie point, you have done so with that. <laughs> <laughs> he helped produce the first image of M87, which was quite an accomplishment, and led the development of novel techniques for analyzing and measuring the shadows of black holes observed with the EHT. He remember, remains a member of the EHT collaboration and is a lead, leading, in his leading a paper describing a method for dynamically uh, imaging sources such as the galactic center on short time scales as part of the effort to image Sagittarius A star. For his work with the collaboration, Joseph was named a Barry and Goldwater Scholar, a two-time finalist for the Leroy Abker Award and a co-recipient of the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. Outside of his research, Joseph is a digital artist and a competitive quarter mile drag racer in the car that you have right now? Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> which is a very nice Corvette. He is also the CTO and co-president of Astro Bale. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome Joseph. Uh, yeah. Please give him That's a warm welcome. Thank you. Where is that? Oh, Where are you? Oh, you are there. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Where are you? Oh, oh, okay. All right. Uh, I'm CTO on behalf of the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration today to discuss my work. Uh, Helping take a picture, the first picture of a black hole. You have okay, yours. Yep, right? I have it on. Should it's, I use the hand phone? Yeah, use it. Okay. Uh, it's terrific. But he has this quote, um, and it was written, you know, way back when. Uh, he has this quote: "Wouldn't it be wonderful uh, if definite proof of the existence of a black hole could be found? Perhaps some incontrovertible proof is just around the corner. Uh, one would like the story of black holes to come to a conclusion with a bang, not a whimper." Uh, and on April 10th, 2019, we had that bang, the first incontrovertible evidence of a supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy far, far away, the image of M87, unveiled to the world by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration in six simultaneous press conferences held around the globe. And M87 itself, the black hole in, this ga in the galaxy of M87, M87, the galaxy is very special. It's an elliptical galaxy, 55 million light years away from Earth. Um, and uh, it's very large and very far away, um, but even though we've been imaging it for a hundred years, from the very beginning, something very uh, interesting about this galaxy has emerged, and that's the presence of this bright sort of feature sparking out from the center. This is M87's jet, and it's pretty much the only reason people look at it, because the rest of it is a dusty boring blob, um, <laughs> like a lens flare, a smudge in your screen. Um, but this jet is incredibly fascinating. Uh, for one thing, it's interesting to anyone doing high energy physics because it kicks off some serious juice, about 5.1 times 10 to the 49 joules per second. To give you some context, the Milky Way galaxy, entire Milky Way galaxy, is 10 trillion times less energetic than just that jet. The entire galaxy does not even come close to matching how much power that jet puts out. And for the last 100 years, we've imaged it in several different wavelengths. <laughs> of it with the Hubble Space Telescope, with the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and most recently radio telescopes and radio arrays, like the very large array in the JCS top. And once you sort of put together the pieces of how big this thing is, hundreds of thousands of layers long, how far away it is, how powerful it is, it begs the question, what on earth could make this? Like, what unnatural force could produce something of this magnitude? And whenever we need to create something that's very powerful and in a very small space, astronomers turn to the explanation of black holes, even though up until you know, a while ago, we didn't really even know for sure that they existed. And this is the simulation of a black hole uh, rendered by the Smithsonian Institute. 
Uh, and black holes are, are this very special feature of Einstein's field theory of general relativity. So in, in the early 1900s, <laughs> Einstein laid out his, his greatest work, possibly, his work with general relativity, a set of equations that describes the entire universe but can fit into the top two lines of a standard, you know, A11 sheet of paper. Um, and uh, basically, general relativity imagines the universe and space and time to be an interwoven continuum uh, through which, as objects pass, their mass and energy warp the continuum. And in turn, this continuum responds back and it changes the trajectory of those objects and their paths. Um, and uh, as soon as Einstein put out this theory, people began asking the question, you know, what, 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 what can it confirm? What can it tell us? Uh, so the uh, equations that describe Einstein's field theory agree with Newton, you know, Newton's mechanics, F equals MA, the standard kinematics equations that we were all familiar with. Um, and they describe this very same force of gravity that, uh, that is a staple of physics, right? Objects of different masses attract. This attraction is dependent on the size of the objects and the distance between them. Uh, but it told us some things that we couldn't explain with Newtonian mechanics, like the precession of the mercurial orbit. So as some of us in the room probably know, Mercury's orbit isn't just an ellipse, right? It's an ellipse that sort of pivots around every couple decades or so. And there's nothing in Newtonian mechanics that can explain this, but general relativity could handle it. Uh, but it also told us new things. That's a really exciting thing when theory tells you something brand new. And one of the new predictions that Einstein's theory of general relativity made back in the early 1900s was that during a solar eclipse, if you measured the positions of, a, of stars at night, and then when the sun was obscured by the moon, the stars' positions would change a bit because their light was being bent around the sun, which is now covering, covered up by the moon. And uh, you know, Eddington went out and did this experiment. He found that the star's light was bent. Their position seemed to change by exactly the amount Einstein predicted with uh, general relativity. And that was really exciting. But uh, one thing Einstein and Newton did agree on is that if you have a big mass, it's got a big potential, and you need big speed to escape it. Uh, and this led, leads naturally to the question, what if you have something super big, how fast, if you get something so big that you need to go faster than the speed of light to escape it? And that's what Schwarzschild sort of wrote down. He solved Einstein's field equations in the trenches of World War I um, for the case of a non-spinning black hole. And basically said, yes, there's a point where if you compress matter enough, uh, you will get an object that's so dense that its gravity is so strong, light can't even escape. Uh, and Einstein didn't believe these things could exist. The math was there, he believed the math, but the idea of taking something as large as the sun and compressing it into an area the size of this room seemed obscene and uh, almost, you know, malarkey. Um, but uh, nonetheless, regardless of Einstein's objections, uh, the field moved forward, and even though we didn't have knowledge of whether or not black holes really existed, people like Kerr, and Newman solved these equations for increasingly complicated sources, like a black hole, a charged black hole, or a rotating black hole, or a, pole, or a charged rotating black hole, or a rotating charged black hole. Yeah, they, they really, they really push the boundary of what you do with like those two things. Um, and this is really useful because uh, even though we don't know, we didn't know black holes existed, and we didn't have definitive proof of them until a couple years ago. Uh, it still meant we need to answer some questions. So when we see something like the jet in MD7. And we assume that a black hole is causing it. We can estimate some properties about the, what the black uh, some properties the black hole must have based on the things we observe about the jet and galaxy. So if we assume there's a black hole, what can we calculate? And one of the things we can calculate is its shadow. So a black hole's shadow is like its most interesting feature, basically. Um, as a black hole bends light around it, um, a dark patch forms because there's a region where if light is within it, it'll fall into the black hole. And if there's, there's a region where light is outside of it, oh, uh, light, light, outside light. Of it, light will escape. And this forms a dark patch on the image that we call the black hole shadow. But really interestingly, on the boundary of these two regions, there's a point where photons can sort of orbit many times before escaping or falling in. And this produces an extremely bright ring right before the edge. This is called the photon ring or the photon orbit. And it's our proxy for the black hole shadow. But basically, if you look, you take a picture of something and you see this, probably a black hole. It's an event horizon, uh, or a lens event horizon, rather. And this is really fascinating. Uh, and the size of the shadow can be very accurately predicted using general relativity. And if we measure this shadow size and shape and the uh, objects surrounding it, we can uh, infer things about the black hole's spin, mass, and inclination. So uh, the angular momentum of the black hole tells us a lot of interesting information about the physics of the black hole itself. And we have predictions, specific predictions, how fast black holes can spin. So if we can test 
test these predictions by actually observing a black hole and measuring its shadow. So uh, with our understanding of general relativity, we can estimate how big the shadow must be and what it must look like. And this is really important because if we understand the shadow, we can, that'll teach us how black holes form, which is very important in cosmology and astrophysics. We have a suspicion that most of the universe at one point was black holes, or in the future, most of the universe will just be black holes. Um, and there's a good reason to believe that black holes will be the last thing to exist in the universe before its eventual heat death. Um, so black holes understanding their lifespan is incredibly, incredibly interesting. And that's why we want to observe the shadow. So um, we can predict that M87 must have a shadow size based on its jet and an estimated mass of 30 to 40 micro arc seconds. And it's kind of impossible to really can see how small a micro arc second is. Look at the shot. So if you take a penny and you place it eight football fields away from it, you can't see it anymore. But that's about an arc second. <laughs> Uh, it's actually two times the size of an arc second, roughly. And a micro arc second is a million times smaller than a penny placed eight football fields away from you. That's the resolution the ESG needs to achieve in order to see M87's shadow, which is hard. Um, but if we can do it, we can also uh, predict what its mass, we can measure what its mass is. And this is really interesting because measuring the shadow of a black hole is not the only way to measure its mass, of course. Um, you can also measure it by watching stars orbit around the black hole, or by watching gas fall in. And we've done both of these things with M87, uh, but they give us different answers. And that's not good, because while 6 versus 3 doesn't seem a lot right now, there's a 10 to the 9 at the end of that, and that's deeply, deeply unfortunate. Um, so basically there's a factor of 2 between our two best estimates of measuring the mass of black holes without actually measuring the shadow. Um, one of them watches star orbit, the other watches gas falling, and they give pretty different answers. So the EHT has a very unique opportunity to actually check which one of these methods is correct. If we can check which one of these methods is correct, the next time we come across a black hole whose shadow we can't see, we know which method we're going to use to accurately um, predict its mass. So there's a ton of exciting stuff going on with EHT, from testing general relativity to testing all these different methods of exploring the universe. But I, I hope at this point, you know, um, the question in your heads is, you know, how could you possibly achieve such a resolution, right? With this telescope so extreme, with a source so extreme, what could, what does it take to observe something like this? And the first answer is, is just person power, right? Uh, the EHD is a global collaboration. It uh, consists of over 200 scientists, we're over 300 now. Um, we really had a big spike right before we got the Breakthrough Prize, which kind of divvied up the money more, which is unfortunate. But overall, <laughs> overall, more people is a good thing. <laughs> Uh, uh, yes, 200 scientists at 60 institutes, 18 countries on six continents. Basically, all over the world, every major institution that has a moderately funded astronomy department has some fingers in the EHT. Um, and it took a lot, a lot of hard work from a lot of people to make this happen over the course of 20 years, uh, which is kind of insane. The context that I like to give is the first EHT paper was published three days before I was born. And at that point, we had like one baseline and we sort of like fuzzily saw there was like a thing maybe there, but we couldn't have an image. It took us 20 more years to get an image. Um, so this has been going on for a long time, and that's what you got to do to do something impossible. Another thing you need is bleeding edge technology. So everything the ESG does is on the forefront, right? We have uh, the telescope itself is the size of the Earth. All the individual telescopes are on the coldest and highest peaks possible, which usually have to do with effects that you never get on the ground, right? Uh, sorry, never get uh, with more normal telescopes. So for example, the telescope up there in the, in the top right, that is the large millimeter telescope in Mexico, or the LMT. Um, and it's so big, it's the single largest radiation the planet. It's so large and it's so cold up there that when the sun rises each morning, it heats the dish up unevenly and causes it to bang. And that was an error we had to calibrate out of our data. Immensely, immensely frustrating error. But this is the kind of thing that, yeah, this is the kind of thing we have to deal with with this level of technology. Uh, our data recording is unbelievably fast. It's, we basically stuck to Moore's law for all of our electronics. And for we have the highest, the uh, EHT takes the crown for the largest amount of data recorded per night of observation of any experiment in the history of physics. At the end of an observation, we have four and a half petabytes of data collected. It is, it's really just, it's just it's big. <laughs> like, everything's big with EHT. And our clocks even, we use hydrogen maser atomic clocks to measure times on nanosecond time scales. Our clocks are so good, and the EHT telescopes know their position on the Earth with such great accuracy that geologists use our telescopes to measure continental drift. That is how sensitive the EHT is. And that's what's required in order to take a picture of something that small. And there's one more thing, and really this is the most important thing, because without, without this, 
everything else sort of goes out the window. The, 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 not, the biggest and most important thing you need to take a picture of a black hole is just raw luck. <laughs> just absolute luck. Uh, sure, amazing things require hard work, but doing something impossible requires like your favorite incantations and praying to whatever gods you believe in. There's a, a great way to demonstrate this, just how much luck wins the issue. I'll demonstrate this in a couple of ways. My favorite one occurred in a documentary on, uh, made by the Smithsonian that was basically documenting how we took the, uh, the first image. And in, at one of the sites, during the observation, something broke, and it was overheating, and it needed to be cooled. And the nearest engineer could cool it was 40 miles away. So you're stuck on the top of a mountain that nobody wants to climb, and it's cold, and it's low oxygen, and you need to come up with a way to save, the, the, you know, to, to, to save this component. And it just led to this amazing, amazing solution. They held the door open with a piece of tape, and this great quote from the documentary, the piece of tape should hold the door open long enough for the observation to be completed. If not, the entire project could fail. <laughs> On the basis of a piece of tape that was holding a door open because our hydrogen matrix clocks are the cheap $20,000 ones and not the expensive six-figure ones. It's a good documentary if you watch it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and our, the luck extends not just to random chance, but to also how the specifics of the interferometer. So this is a special formula that, for the astronomers in the room, this is nothing new, but uh, I'll explain it for the, um, the people who are less familiar with astronomy. This is a uh, measure of diffraction limit, basically, which is even less helpful, actually, than if you just look at the formula. This measures resolution. <laughs> this formula tells you if you're observing at a particular wavelength of light with a telescope of size p, it tells you how good your resolution is going to be. And the way we define resolution in astronomy is you take two blobs, and you get them really close together, uh, once you cannot distinguish them as two blobs, and they just look like one blob, that's resolution. And that's calculated by this formula. So basically, you can improve your resolution two ways. You can either uh, increase your, the wavelength of light that you're observing at, make it longer and longer, or, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, or you can, um, sorry, make it shorter and shorter. No, longer and longer. I'm good. And, or you can make your dish bigger. Um, and so th those two ways are how we push technology to its limit. Basically, that's what we did. We, we pushed our telescopes to the uh, shortest wavelength we could at the time, 1.3 millimeter radio telescopes. Um, for those of us who can't divide by the speed of light in our head, that's 230 gigahertz, which is well beyond anything we listen to you know, on the radio. Um, and we put our telescopes in the most extreme locations of the globe, as far north as, the, as Greenland, as far south as the literal South Pole, and all the way in Hawaii and Spain, and just all over the place, and achieved a diameter equal to that of the Earth, 12,000 odd kilometers. And we needed to achieve this resolution because you know that this this extremeness barely gives us enough resolution to see how many seven's shadow. So remember that shadow we predict to be 30 to 40 micro arc seconds, and we just barely have enough resolution to determine that little that little divot, uh, the, the little shadow of any seven. Uh, so uh, the question, oh, sorry. Oh yeah. Uh, so I keep mentioning the fact that this is an Earth-sized telescope, the telescope the size of the globe, right? Or, you know, it's the size of the Earth, and Earth's interferometer. But how is this actually possible, right? Um, the cool thing is, it's not a real telescope. It's a virtual telescope um, that we, it's essentially a bunch of stations spread over the planet to achieve this resolution, uh, connected using magic. Uh, sorry, I mean, interferometry. <laughs> and uh, interferometers are very special. So if you have an on-sky source like this, an interferometer does not see this image. It sees something special called the Fourier transform. And I'm not going to go too much into the math, but basically a Fourier transform takes a function like the square wave, and it tells you how to make it using sines and cosines. And this is really cool for a number of reasons. First of all, we're looking at light, which travels as a wave, so this is an extremely convenient representation of, of light we see. But it has a very important property, which is that if you Fourier transform function, and then you take that Fourier transform, and you Fourier transform it again, it does something very special. It gives you the original function back out. And this is called invertibility, and it's a very important property because it means that if we see a Fourier transform in the sky, all we have to do is take its Fourier transform and we get the original image out, which is really cool. And so that's what an interferometer sees. So if you have your source, it's emitting some waves towards two, you know, two telescopes. They're connected by a baseline, and this baseline has direction and magnitude. Uh, the measurement you make along this direction corresponds exactly to the point in the UV plane with the same direction and magnitude. And if you have telescopes all over the world and you have an infinite number of baselines, the Fourier transform for something like this 
this image of a black hole, will look like this. It's sort of like you drop a stone in a pond and you watch the ripples. It's called a Bessel function. Um, and it's a very common Fourier transform for these kinds of sources. But the EHT, and this is a critical bit, the EHT doesn't see that. The EHT, because we don't have telescopes everywhere, because most governments would not be okay with that, although I can fire that, that was an issue. The EHT doesn't see this. We see this. We have a very sparse coverage. Um, we don't see the full Fourier transform, we only see the points where you see the white dots. And we need, in order to invert the Fourier transform and get the original image back out, we have to know everything about the Fourier transform. So this presents an interesting problem. But before you comment, uh, before you sort of make a judgment how sparse this is, this is actually an amazing amount of coverage that's produced by a really cool process called aperture synthesis. So on the left here, I have the Earth and two stations. Um, this one is one of the ones in uh, Chile, either Alma or Apex, and there's one up in Spain. And they're connected by this baseline, and as you can see, it corresponds to the same, oops, I'm not going to do that. It corresponds to the same point, uh, the point that has the same magnitude and direction as the unique point, and we measure a flux density. So basically how a combinatorial data product, you can give it as how, how bright things are along this baseline. I won't get more complicated than that. Um, so what how, right, this, this baseline has a specific direction and magnitude, but what happens when the Earth rotates? The direction and magnitude of that line changes. And so, as the Earth rotates throughout a night, we slowly fill out the UV plane with each of these baselines coming into view, and the rotation of the Earth itself fuels our telescope. So for a night of observation, we set up our baselines and we wait for the Earth to rotate, setting up each part of our telescope to look at the source one at a time. And at the end, we get this beautiful data product it's sort of double hump. That's the vessel function that we saw earlier, the, the stone ripple, but we're looking at it sort of one-dimensionally. And that is what we fit. That's what we use to make an image. And I'm going to do this several times in the presentation, but I'd like to make a quick shout out to some of the members of the EHT who work on this specific aspect of the project. So on the left, we have Lindy Blackburn, a nerd. And on the middle, we have Sarah Isaou, a grad student and also a nerd. And on the right, oh, she's actually she's a postdoc now at the CFA. I should have remembered that. And on the right, we have Macha. Uh, he was a postdoc. I don't know where he is now, but they were primarily responsible for producing the uh, data product that you saw before. They're the, the calibration and error team, and they take our data and from this massive, you know, several hundreds of gigabytes, and they reduce it down to this beautiful one plot that we can use to fit all of our uh, data. What is the acronym POPS? Oh, so that POPS refers to, um, I actually don't know what POPS stands for specifically, but it's a haystack something processing system. Um, it refers to, yeah, yeah, Haystack Observatory. I think probably Haystack Observatory processing system, yeah. Um, and Lindy at, at had developed the HOPS uh, data reduction pipeline, basically, is what it is. Um, yeah, so HOPS takes our data and includes it. And so from their hard work, we get this our coverage and what the coverage sees, which is this beautiful, you know, double pump feature. Um, and so, you know, all these baselines are on this physical location. So this is right, Alma in Chile, the SMT in Hawaii. This is uh, LMT in Mexico, the telescope I showed you earlier, the Pico Valenta. Uh, these are all just mountains and locations of the world, but with just a few telescopes, we can mostly get a good idea of what the Fourier transform looks like. And so this is our final data product, and we have to take this and turn it into an image. But there's a little problem. So if I give you a bunch of points, a lot of them, you can probably tell me what the original function was. And if I take a waypoint, there's a point, there's a transition where you no longer have enough points to uniquely define the function. So this still fits the function I was showing you before with all those points, but it also fits this, and this, and this, and that. So which one is correct? And this is exactly the problem the EHT has. We have an incomplete function, and we need to fit to it. So how do we reconcile the fact that there is a literal, uncountably infinite number of functions that can fit our data properly? What do we do? And the answer is we bring in assumptions. So we make we have knowledge about the source from longer wavelengths or from other um, you know observing campaigns, and we can make certain assumptions. Like for example, we can assume that the function has to lie within these two blue lines, and that immediately chops up any function that goes above or below. So that's a great way to narrow down the space. We can also make assumptions about the shape of the function. So if we have a parameter that measures smoothness, we can enforce by changing this parameter that the function has a certain level of smoothness. A smoothness. And this is called regularization, and the method is called regularized maximum likelihood. And it boils down to this equation. The first part of the equation probably looks familiar. This is just a data equation. So uh, uh, this is just a chi-squared. So all we're asking is, 
how well did our image fit the data with that first term? And on a normal project, that would be enough with a normal data set. But because the EHD has a sparse coverage, we have to look at other stuff. And that's where the second term comes in. It asks, how well does the image fit our assumptions? And this is all in the service of inverting the Fourier transform. So getting, taking this Fourier transform and put it, turning it back into an image. And there are other algorithms that do this. For example, the clean imaging algorithm, which simply assumes that everything we don't see is zero and then attempts to actually just invert the equation, uh, invert the Fourier transform directly. And it does not work very well at first, but through an iterative procedure, you can get a pretty good image. Um, so these are the two primary computing methods we have, RML and clean. Uh, and they have their own strengths and weaknesses. So RML is great. You can create pretty much any image, but it's problematic because you can pretty much create any image. Um, if you just change your parameters, you can literally create any image you want. And if you have strong enough prior, you can bias your image. And clean is a little less um, alarming in that respect, but it relies a ton on the expertise of the user. So if you give the same data set to two different you know, clean imagers, they might give you two completely different images. And that's unfortunate. And they'll both be correct. Um, and also, because clean is user driven, it's difficult to script and check any of the parameters. And all this bias is severely problematic for the EHG for this reason. These, up top, I have four different sources that look completely different, right? We have a ring, we have a crescent, so it's a ring with like an asymmetry, and then we have a disk, and then we have two blocks. And so the, to our interferometer, they all look the same. This is not good, right? We have to demonstrate that our interferometer can differentiate between these two, these four um, and more scenarios that are, have wildly different astrophysical interpretations, but uh, sort of very similar Fourier transforms. And so the way we avoid bias is a two-step process, blind imaging and synthetic data. So the way blind imaging works is you know that everyone brings in different assumptions, what you trust, what you don't trust, what tools you use, how you use them. So how do you make sure that any image you produce is resistant to those assumptions? And the way you do it is this blind imaging process. Basically, you have everyone make their own image. In this case, we have four different teams working with four different methods. Everyone makes their own image. And they do it in secret, so they don't tell each other, so you can't bias the results. You know, if I see someone else's image, I might try to make mine look like theirs. And that's not good. I need to produce a unique image so that I can demonstrate that mine is free of bias. Um, or at least it only has my bias in it. And so the idea is all four teams worked for secret, uh, took the data sets, worked in secret uh, on them for, for months, and then uh, met at the EHT Imaging Workshop, where we produced the first image. So this workshop was put together by myself, Sarah, Arish, Andrew Shale, who's now a Princeton uh, postdoc, and Katie Bauman, who uh, some of you may have heard of her. She's now a Caltech and assistant professor. Um, and at this workshop, we uh, organized you know, hackathons and sort of informal discussions and presentations, all without showing the actual images. And then we all, on the second day of the workshop, came together and basically showed what we had. So four different teams working on the same data set in completely different ways. These are the first four images of M87 that they arrived at. They look pretty good. They look different though, but they look similar, right? They have qualities that are the same throughout the images. And those are the qualities that we trust. The qualities that look different, we say, okay, well, it could be spurious. So what's the two, what, what are the quality, what are the image qualities that they all share, right? They all have a ring. That's a, that's a relief. <laughs> it means we can trust that there's a shadow and we're not just inventing something. They all have a ring. It's all about, all, all the rings are about 40 micro arc seconds in diameter, which is good. And they all have, like, seem to have an asymmetry towards the south, so all the images are brighter in the south region. And this turns out to be a, caused by a number of really cool effects, which I can explain uh, if you guys like afterwards. But uh, these are the first four images that we got. And we average them together to produce the first consensus image. And I think this moment to highlight a couple more folks. Um, so this is Michael Johnson and uh, Kazuri Abiyama. Michael was my supervisor, two year old down face. I'm now leaving after four years almost. It's a very sad enough. And Kazu, they were the uh, two leaders of the imaging work group when the image was made. Uh, we got Andrew Shale, who wrote the ESG Imaging Library, and Katie, who helped develop the blind imaging procedure. And two grad students, Sarah Isaoun and Liam, uh, Liam Zero. So Sarah worked on the imaging procedures, and Liam worked on theoretical physics interpretations. And uh, myself and Daniel, who were at the time two of the youngest members of the collaboration, he was a first year grad student, and I was an undergraduate. Um, I was a second year undergraduate at the time. And so there's just a huge variety of, uh, of the diversity of, of age and ethnicity and, and you know, nationality in the EHT and experience. Um, because fundamentally, uh, we all, we're all trying to answer the same question. And it's very fascinating how that tends to remove all sorts of barriers to success. 
Uh, and uh, this would be incomplete if I didn't point out Chef Dolman, who's the director of the project, who's been working on this since its conception and has, you know, just absolutely driven it since uh, since it started it 20 years ago. Okay, so this, that's blind imaging, and that worked really well. But the second way we mitigate bias is by a synthetic data testing. So basically, we make fake data and we test our algorithms on that. Um, so remember these guys, the really annoying ones that look all the same when you're viewing them through the interferometer's glasses? Well, they're actually going to be helpful because we can generate fake data based on these models and then image them and then see if we can tell them apart. So here I have uh, all the uh, algorithm's attempts at producing images of the synthetic data at the top. And what you can see is that pretty much uh, we're able to differentiate between the sources. So when we're given the, that data, which looks pretty much the same, we can tell whether it's a ring, whether it's a crescent, whether it's a disk, whether it's a blob, or a special uh, simulation called a GRHD. Um, and this is really encouraging because it means that our algorithm, if you've never seen these source types before, can reproduce them even though they look very similar. And this is good because it gives us confidence that when we encounter something brand new, we can reproduce it. Uh, so some of these algorithms like EHD imaging and Smiley, they have lots of parameters that can be tweaked. So what we do is we do massive parameter surveys over literally every possible parameter combination, and we pick out the ones that look the best on fake data, and then we take those and we apply them to the real data. And that's literally the whole procedure. Like, that's how we pick our best parameters. We have a fake suite of static data that we say this is a representative of astrophysics, and we test our algorithms on that, and whatever it says is best, we use without question. This is to avoid introducing bias where we see something we don't expect, so we tweak the parameters a bit to get rid of it. So that we commit before we do any of the real imaging. So at the end of this process, we get this. These are the four images from the four days um, of observation, and excitingly, you can sort of see what looks like maybe a hot spot moving across the bottom from uh, uh, east to west, um, and that would be really cool. But since it's smaller than this circle, which represents our revolution, you can't trust it technically, but I like to speculate. Um, but I, I do want to point this out. This is really our resolution. So um, the shadow is not much bigger than what we can, the smallest thing we can see. Um, and uh, effectively, you know, this ASU is a $70 million project plus, especially from the NSF alone, and it re reduces down to a four pixel by four pixel image. An image that you know got a Google Google and the next KCD and it's seen by it's seen by literally everybody. Um, so it's, it's kind of it's kind of mind-boggling what will you know shift things and, and what will make splashes and what drives science for it as a whole. So now that we've got an image, let's measure it, right? All we have to do is slap a ruler on it and it tell us all sorts of stuff about the black holes like mass, the spin, and inclination. And uh, we can't just slap a ruler on it, of course, because rulers I'm sure have some intrinsic bias. Um, but we can use computer algorithms to do what rulers normally do uh, and you know, develop algorithms that basically march around this image and objectively look at how big things are based on some criterion, like the peak, right? If you, extend, if you look at the flux in this direction, it's going to have some Gaussian shape. And you can look at the peak, and that'll tell you how big it is. Uh, and at the end of that, we can get a mean radius, and that'll tell us the size. And if we know the size, average size of the shadow, we can estimate the mass. We can also look at different parameters like the span and inclination of the rotation on the sky by directly fitting models. So on the right, I have a crescent model that looks sort of like this black hole on the left. And the way we achieve it is we construct the shape using these parameters. So the parameters you see over there correspond to RB is the size of a big disk, RC is the size of a little disk we cut out of it, and then O is how much the offset, which tells you shift the little disk around, and phi is how it's rotated on the sky. And we can take those parameters and convert them into astrophysical parameters using um, using our understanding of physics. And in order to find which parameters best fit them, we can uh, take a model and basically transform it in a number of ways until it looks the most like the data. Normally, I'm, I have an image up here for comparison, but we would do this directly to the data, not the image itself. Um, but you can see how by checking a bunch of different parameters, you can get an image that looks like uh, what, you're trying to, what you're trying to find. And once we have all those parameters, we can convert them directly into astrophysical parameters, like those masks and the inclination of the black hole. And this is yet another way where we have you know, a bunch of different methods trying to answer the same question. How big is the black hole? And therefore, how massive? So we have image domain feature extraction, which is the first thing I showed you, where we march around the ring and we look at how big it is. The geometric models, where we have like a disk inside of a disk, and we try to figure out where we have to place the two disks and how big they have to be in order to best match the data. And finally, we simulate black holes just directly. And we ask, if we assume general relativity is correct, and we simulate a black hole, what simulation looks most like the data? And all three of these methods give the same answer, six and a half times 10 to the nine solar masses. Um, so for context, you and I probably weigh about 10 to the one, 10 to the two 
kilograms. Uh, the Earth is, you know, 26 orders of magnitude larger. The Sun is six orders of magnitude larger than that, and then this is nine, a billion, you know, a, a billion times larger than the Sun. Um, it's just inconceivable. Uh, but it's also very interesting because it appears that the stellar model was correct. So we have the two predictions. One predicted three and a half billion solar masses from gas dynamics. The other predicted six and a half billion solar masses from stellar dynamics. Okay. So to this day, when people want to use uh, measure the mass of a black hole, they now use the stellar dynamics model because that's the one we showed was correct. Uh, and interestingly, the guy that wrote the Stellar Dynamics paper emailed us after the image came out. And he was like, congratulations on getting the correct answer, <laughs> which is a little, which is, okay, I'm not gonna lie, it was legendary, but uh, he was correct, uh, which was which is super awesome. Um, so how many of you are just curious if you heard of LIGO, the laser infrared? I've heard of LIGO, 100%. Okay, great. So um, LIGO, basically what LIGO measures is, for those of you that don't, that don't know, it uh, can listen to when two black holes or two neutron stars or a black hole and a neutron star collide. Um, and that creates a physical sound as it ripples space time. And we can measure that with this special, uh, this special device. And now when two black holes collide, they produce sound that can be measured by LIGO, but LIGO actually measures pretty small black holes in the scale of the HT. So it, it measures stellar mass black hole, stellar mass black hole collisions. Um, ranging from you know a couple solar masses to like 80 solar masses, but M87 is a lot larger. So converting to log scale, gorgeous. M87, basically a billion times larger than any of the black holes. That when they collide, there's so much energy that we hear it. Uh, uh, you know, we can hear it traveling through space. And that's a gross oversimplification, but that is pretty much how the image the uh, Horizon scales the image. And really, what this boils down to is the EHT is a scale, a scale we use for weighing black holes. We place the Earth on one end <laughs> and the black hole on the other, and we can measure the mass of a black hole whose shadow we can see using the Event Horizon Telescope. And that is just the craziest thing. And it's only possible because of the EHT status as a global interferometer. So it's not just global because we have telescopes all over the world. It's global because we have hundreds of people with all sorts of expertise, you know, working together to produce something that basically to take an image of something that's never been seen before using a, an instrument that's never been calibrated. It's an impossible task, and it requires decades of work from hundreds of people and a healthy dose of luck. Um, so I'd like to leave you with a couple images. The first is, uh, this was the, <laughs> this image kind of viral a bit after the image of the black hole just came out. But uh, when we went down to Washington DC for the press conference, the next day we walked into the airport to fly back and every single newspaper had the black hole in it. Every single one, every newspaper around the world has a black M87 image above the fold. Like, when was the last time you saw a mass measurement above the fold on the front page of the New York Times? Right? There's something about this project that just that speaks to people. It speaks to the human desire to see the unknown, right? Uh, uh, ancient sailors followed the sea, and we look for the horizon. And that's something Chef said. Chef made that up. I don't want to take that quote, but. Uh, um, but it really, it's true. It's, 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 it's a discovery, it's an expedition in a way that's never really before been possible in the history of humanity, and it's, it was reflected in the sort of outcome and the magnitude of what we, what we showed. Uh, and so I'd like to leave you with a final image. This is Chef, the director of the project. 20 years, we saw the image for the first time. I don't know who's recording, but because there wasn't supposed to be cameras there. But, that was uh, the, the look in his face. And I think that really sums it up. It's the man who has been compared to like Galileo and like Newton um, and Einstein himself. And for 20 years, he's done nothing but push us in pursuit of this single 16 pixel image. And uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, guys, for listening. So after we published this image, we finally had a chance to take a break and uh, pursue some more interesting things about what we can do with the data we have. Um, and one of the interesting things we can do is called polarimetry. So uh, light is a wave, right? It's a, uh, it, it oscillates up and down, and it has a bunch of qualities, one of which is orientation. Uh, or, and this is also called, when, when all the light waves that you observe are traveling one direction, that's called polarization. Um, so for example, you might have polarized sunglasses. Um, they, uh, they force, uh, you know, they, they only allow light of a certain polarization to go through, and that dims everything you see. Um, and, I, 
I, I wish I, uh, this is going to sound ridiculous, but that's actually pretty much what the DHT does with its polar polarimetry. So uh, when we look at a black hole, the light we see is passing through a bunch of dust. That dust is arranged by a magnetic field coming out of the black hole. And as the light passes through, it's reoriented as well by the magnetic field um, as it passes through the disk grains. And so by looking at the polarization or the orientation of the light waves we see coming out of the black hole, we can figure out how the dust grains must have been aligned around the black hole, and therefore the magnetic field, strength, and direction of the black hole. And this tells us about how powerful the black hole is and things about its shape and everything, uh, which is really cool. And that's the image you're seeing. So the, the image that you saw with the magnetic field lines, that comes from the polarimetry uh, working group, where they look at the orientation of the light on the image, and it's plotted on top of the images here. That's a good question. Thank uh, you. For the audience. Yeah. Okay. Uh, congratulations to you and your colleagues on a really outstanding and robust result. Thank you. So you're reconstructing from sparse interferometer data. Uh, what are the consequences for your point spread function? Is it supposed to be stationary and symmetric? That is a terrific question. So I actually showed the point spread function at one point. That's the dirty beam. Oh, wait, I guess that's it. oh yeah, sorry, the question. Can yeah. we just uh, put it, you know, crystallize yeah. the question? Yeah, sorry. So, uh, um, uh, 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 could you get your name, sir? Oh, what was your name? Oh, Ed Walsh. Ed Walsh. Uh, so Ed asked about the point spread function of our interferometer. Is it like nice and constrained, or is it like wild? And this is a well, the point spread function of our interferometer. So uh, for those that don't know, a point spread function asks the question: If you have like an object that, if you have a device that sees things, and you give it a delta function, which is just a very thin spike, what will it do to it? Um, so if you've ever looked at a light that's very far away, where you can't see the light itself, but you can see the light around it. Uh, what you're seeing is not the light, but the point spread function of the atmosphere illuminated by the light. When you see a star, unless you have extremely good eyes, you're probably seeing the point spread function of the atmosphere. Um, and the ESG has the same problem. Uh, so when we look through all the dust of the, I mean, you see the galaxy, all the atmosphere of the Earth, we have a point spread function as well. And it's this thing called the dirty beam. And it's very unpleasant. <laughs> it's not nice at all. <laughs> so if you take this image and convolve it with the point spread function, you get that. So that's what our image would look like if we didn't have these advanced techniques. Mm -hmm. um, but the clean itself is an iterative procedure that basically identifies what in the point spread function is real and what isn't uh, to determine the, the final image. Very good. Thank you. Uh, just to, uh, any, I want to alternate. Is there a Zoom question? Or? Uh, I don't have any. Uh, ask if there's any. Uh, anyone on Zoom have a question? Because I can't see the computer, so I'm going to ask anyone. Yes. They can hear you. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, uh, I'll think yeah, sure. Um, if you add more observation points, more radio telescopes, do you improve the resolution? That is a very good question. Um, so uh, yes and no. Um, so the diffraction equation right, tells us that if we improve the diameter of our long wave baseline or the wavelength of light that we observe at, we'll improve our resolution. So I'll answer the no part of the question first. If you just add telescopes that operate at the same wavelength, with baselines shorter than the longest one we have, that will not improve resolution, but it will improve um, certain other properties of the network. If you add uh, telescopes with the same observing frequency, but you place them outside of the current existing array, that will improve the interferometer. And if you add telescopes that have higher resolution, I'm uh, sorry, if you add telescopes that have a higher observing frequency, that will also increase the resolution of the interferometer. Um, and we're doing that right now. So we currently have three sites set up on 345 gigahertz. Which would, if we got all of our sites working at 345 gigahertz, would improve our resolution by a factor of, uh, like a factor of two, pretty much. Uh, which would improve a factor of, by, by 50, about 50 percent. Um, we're also working on putting telescopes in space, which would give us huge baselines with insane resolution to be able to measure spin of like any black hole we saw, and we have thousands of black holes open up to us. And we actually, I just helped submit a NIAC proposal a couple weeks ago, and at the Cato uh, review proposal, two two of them uh, last year, because we are very eager to answer that exact question. Um, the resolution of the ESG. Did you invite the Chinese with their new radio telescope and like Fox and Jardel Bank to uh, participate? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, the telescope in China, you're talking about FAST, right? Right. Um, so that telescope cannot really be part of the EHT because uh, even though it's enormous and has a terrific, uh, uh, a terrific collecting area, I don't think it operates at a high enough, uh, risk, a high enough frequency and it can't be pointed. It relies on the Earth to uh, swivel it. And we need insane pointing accuracy. Um, and it was the same problem with Arecibo before it got totaled. Uh, yes? Could you explain or talk about how the data was received, how it was stored, how it was transmitted back, and also how it was correlated 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, that is, a, so I, I know superficially about that, right? Because I didn't work on the correlators of the data collection and I was on the imaging and analysis and the GR stuff. Um, but I, I know loosely about the process. So um, the telescopes themselves, you know, they, uh, they have a the receiver uh, bandwidth is eight gigabits, eight gigabytes, and they, they, they transcribe data at 64 gigabits per second. Um, they, that's pretty much at the time it was like the fastest in the world. Uh, the telescopes themselves have two observing channels. Um, so we say 230 gigahertz is the observing frequency, but in reality, it's two channels that are fairly close, like 200. 22 gigahertz to 226 gigahertz, and then 228 gigahertz to 232 gigahertz. Um, and once that data is recorded onto our basically just hard drives, um, remember these are these telescopes are located at the highest points in the world, and one of them is in South Pole. We can't just you know upload it to Google Drive. It's four and a half petabytes of data. We have to literally ship the drives back to the correlators. One is located in Haystack, the other is located in Bonn, Germany. Um, and that was one of the reasons making the image too so long, because there's only one plane that flies out of the South Pole every year, uh, and we have to literally put the data on that plane, um, as well as the people, but you know, like, whatever. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, so uh, once the data is on the plane, it gets shipped to the four letters, as I mentioned. Um, and basically, we have that insane timestamp resolution that I mentioned, or like nanosecond timescales. We take all the data and we align them in time, and that's what the correlation procedure does. It aligns the wavefronts as they're arriving on the baselines according to, uh, you know, some interferometry formula, and it requires a huge, two huge supercomputers to get all the work done in a couple months. Um, the chef himself has a joke that he likes to make, where when he's running down the hall carrying all the physical drives, he like, says he's the fastest form of information transfer ever conceived, which is correct. Um, but uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's an insane amount of data, and we haven't come up with a good solution for transmitting it yet. Um, right now, we just ship the physical drives back and, you know, hope they don't break. Uh, we are working on a, a satellite that can make observations and beam them back to Earth using a laser in real time. And that would give us like 100 gigabit per second efficiency. And there's some problems associated with it. It's something we're working on. Um, oh, yeah, that's a good question. His book, uh, Einstein's Shadow, was really interesting. Yeah, right, right. Seth Fletcher, right? That yeah. was super fascinating. There's a, a documentary, Black Hole Hunters, on the Smithsonian Channel, too, if you guys are interested in checking that out. And there's a Netflix documentary called um, Black Holes, as you've always known, by Peter Gallison. And I'm actually in that one. So <laughs> you're not tired of my fake yet. Um, feel free to check that one out. But, uh, uh, yes. Um, could you talk about why in 87 was chosen as the first candidate? And also, what other candidate supermassive black holes would be a choice for like the second or the third or the fourth picture? Yeah. Yes, that's a great question. Um, there are old, so the EHT actually in 2017 achieved the best resolution it could, the highest observing frequency, the longest baseline spread of the whole world, right? And with that resolution, it is just barely enough to see two black holes, just enough. M87 is one of them. The other is the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And they are about the same size, even though they're very, very different black holes. So M87 is a thousand times more massive than the black hole in the center of the Milky Way, but it's a thousand times farther away. And so it looks roughly the same angular size on the sky. The reason we picked it from our long, long list of two choices <laughs> is because M87 doesn't have the issue. Right? When you look at the center of our galaxy, you have to look through all the dust and all the all the, in the occluding dust of the interstellar medium. Um, and on top of that, because that just starts so small, it evolves a lot faster. So it's very difficult to make an image of it. We have to make a movie. And this is the problem that I'm working on actively right now. Uh, so you mentioned that I'm uh, leading a paper that basically explains how to correctly make movies of Sagittarius star. Um, but M87 was chosen because it's very slow to evolve. There's not a lot of dust to look through. And it's like the only one we can see. <laughs> if we could do it again, we'd still have to look at M87 and Sagittarius star. But if we increase the resolution, we would have access to thousands of more uh, baselines. Uh, you asked the resolution question, actually. Yeah, we'd have thousands of more uh, black holes to look at. You get too much data that you just can't process at all. There's no. If you add like five data. more big telescopes, will that just overwhelm you? Oh no! So we've we've done simulations with as many as you know 30 sites, which give us hundreds of baselines, and in space too, with like insane time resolution, and we, we can handle it. But the current processing here really can't. Uh, yes. It's a big black hole question. If they uh, appear to be just two-dimensional objects, and you look at the image, does it have that infinity spin uh, to it, or does it have some three dimensions? 
that is a very good question. Actually, um, can we repeat the question? Oh yeah, there's a question. Actually, I'm sorry, sorry, I keep forgetting. So, um, yeah, so I'm gonna open it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the question, the question was, okay, the, the question was, um, are black holes two dimensional or are they like really thin? Do they have shape? Uh, and they definitely do. And I actually have a, um, I have a movie I can show you of a black hole moving around. Uh, let me pull that up. So uh, if you look at a black hole, you're correct, from one, from one angle, because the way light is bent around a black hole, any one angle, it'll just look two-dimensional. But it looks two-dimensional from all sides, because it's not a circle or a sphere, it's a four-dimensional hole. Uh, and that's really cool. For, in fact, I should probably not talk about how cool that is, because I will start, my voice starts getting really high pitched when I start talking about something like that. OK, so this is a simulation of if you were walking or oh, I don't have Wi-Fi. OK, uh, next. Yes, there we go. Okay, this is what a black hole looks like as you're moving around it, so you're changing your inclination to eye. So it does look like a 2D image, but as soon as you start to, uh, as, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, as soon as you start to turn the black hole around, you can see that it's got a very thick dimensional shape, and it's super cool. And this simulation takes so long to run, but it's so worth it. Yeah. Like this, this alone takes three weeks to make this like 15 second do it video. Um, but it's so worth it at the end because it's really impossible to uh, it's really impossible to get a sense of scale and like activity of these things without movies like this where you're moving around them and you're really absorbing them. Uh, and I have like a bunch more simulations too. They're all they're all super cool. Um, I don't know. Why this is cool. Okay. Every black hole have uh, jets. That is a very good question. Uh, no, uh, it's not. There's no necessary condition that a black hole should have a jet. Um, and in fact, we're not sure if that is star, the center of black hole, the center of our galaxy does. Um, some conditions you need for a jet are, like, I mean, the biggest one is you need a ton of extraneous matter, right? The jet is created by stuff that gets super close to the black hole's event horizon, but literally can't pretty much fit in. So it gets shot off along the magnetic field lines. And they can be immensely powerful and super long. So they're very easy to see. And if Sagittarius star had a jet, you'd probably be able to see it. So there's good reason to believe that not every supermassive black hole has a jet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.